When my mom and dad and my brother and I first came to America when I was seven years old, we came here with 50 bucks and a piano. I'm living proof anything is achievable. Eddie Van Halen was born on January 26th in 1955, and they were actually born in the Netherlands, and they didn't end up coming to the States until the early 1960s. And the big thing that people need to understand about Eddie, like Randy, is he was also brought up with music. So his dad was a multi-instrumentalist. So they already had a really good exposure for music in the family. So Eddie Van Halen being one of the most influential guitar players of rock and metal in the 1970s and 1980s, it should be no surprise that at a very young age, he was brought up with all kinds of musical inspiration. So Eddie actually started off with playing the piano. His dad was the one who introduced him into playing the piano, but soon Soon after, he kind of got bored of it, and that's when he kind of moved to playing the electric guitar at the age of 12. So now, Eddie has a very wide variety of learning. Obviously, he picked up some music theory things from his dad. He picked up some technique on his own with using his ear and other music theory things with his ear, and um, especially listening to records like guys like Jimi Hendrix was a huge inspiration to Eddie at such a young age. And with his brother Alex being able to play the drums at a very young age, too, it was very easy for them to form a band and start understanding these concepts at a very young age. And that's the thing that people need to understand is when you start off music when you are very young, especially in a musical environment, you are basically like painting out a really good rapid growth of music from a very young age. And by the time you are older, you're a lot more advanced than all of the other players around you. So it was actually in 1972 when Alex and Eddie actually formed their band titled Van Halen. And that's when they also met their bassist, Michael Anthony, and they were kind of getting everybody else together like David Lee Roth and they were starting to write their own music and all that really good stuff. So Van Halen didn't actually get their big record deal until 1978, and that's when they released their self-titled album. So it was a little bit of practice for sure and a little bit of musical exposure that really got them to where they are today. And throughout the 70s and 80s, Van Halen made many very, very good albums. You know, things like Van Halen 2 or things like Fair Warning, Women and Children First, 1984. There were so many really awesome albums that Van Halen made. And and each of them had its own kind of sort of style and flair and fleet. And most of the songwriting is usually down to Eddie and Alex. Um, they were the main songwriters for Van Halen. And Eddie had an amazing career even outside of Van Halen. He got to be featured on the song Beat It with Michael Jackson. And that is like top tier insane career um, resume building stuff. Um, not very many people get to work with such a big artist like Michael Jackson. And tragically, Eddie Van Halen did pass away in 2020 due to cancer. It was a long battle for him. But to this day, still, he holds a legacy as one of the greatest rock and metal lead guitarists of all time. So with all that being said, you clicked on this video to hear more about Eddie's genius, to hear more about some of the amazing things that he wrote, some of the amazing things that he played. And that's what we're here to talk about. We're here to do a deep dive into the music theory of Eddie Van Halen, talking about everything from his really weird chord progressions to the scales that he used, to the guitar solos. In general, just the ultimate genius of the songwriting and the playing that was Eddie Van Halen. So the very first song that we have to look at is Running With The Devil, which is the very first song on their self-titled album from 1978. So the tuning is a half step down, but we're just gonna be referencing it in E standard just to make things a little bit easier to digest. But just know that that was the tuning for this entire album that they did end up using. So right off the bat, this is the chord progression for Running With The Devil. We have C, D, D, G, A, E, and yes, those are all major chords. What key is running with the devil in? Because this chord progression is really weird and it kind of doesn't really make any sense off the bat. So let's see what we can figure out. So right off the bat, the first thing to listen to is the bass, of course, because the bass usually tells us everything. Now the bass is honestly just holding a quarter note of hitting E. Bow, 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 bow which is very very evident that maybe we just are in the key of E. It might be a little weird that we have an A major chord 
right here. So we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the possibilities that we have. See, the weird part is, is if we use this E chord as a dominant chord, it actually sounds more like we should resolve into the key of A. So initially, if I play through this and I play all these chords and then I stop at an A, play an E chord, and then I go resolve back to the A, it's going to sound like a sense of completion. So it's like, what are we in the key of A major? Well, that wouldn't be too weird considering the fact that the bass note is playing an E, which is the fifth of A, and that's not too weird. But we're going to go over three different possibilities of what Running With The Devil is actually doing in the intro. The first possibility is the one that we just talked about where we're in the key of A major. The E chord is the dominant chord, which would be at the end of the progression, which can kind of make sense. Um, we would just have to label certain things a little bit weird because this would technically be considered a flat three chord kind of like this that would technically be the correct roman numeral for that and the with the g chord if we were in the key of a major then that would be a flat seven chord because as we know in the key signature of a major we have a g sharp now it's not horrible but it's also maybe not the best thing so let's take a look at some of the other possibilities the second way is a really cool way that i actually really like but may still not be the answer but check this out it's pretty nice so if we take a look at this as not in the key of E minor, but in the relative major of G major, that could potentially work because all these chords would make kind of enough sense except for the E major chord, but we'll talk about that in a second here. But the big thing is the A major chord would actually be considered a secondary dominant chord, right? Because in the key of G major, the chord D major would be resolved after A major if we were using a secondary dominant chord. And it actually sounds kind of nice if we resolve this whole thing into D at the very end instead of E. So the third way would be an E mixolydian scale. Considering the bass line is holding E quarter notes and it could make some sense because the resolution to A major like we did over in example one. However, even this example may not be correct because the accidentals with the rest of the chords really don't line up super great. But regardless of which possibility, this is a really good example of Eddie using chord borrowing. And when he kind of walks up the fretboard like that with those major triads, it sounds really good and something like that is pretty impressive to kind of use and not really have any sort of diatonic center so it's something to learn that going outside of the typical diatonic function of chords can be very beneficial for writing more spicier stuff and the only really weird coincidence that i notice is i can rewrite this whole chord progression and spell caged i thought that was pretty interesting but anyways, so let's talk about the instrumental song Eruption. Most of the song is in A minor, uses mostly blues scale, pentatonic scale, natural minor scale, major scale, that kind of thing. Nothing too out of the ordinary in most of it, except for the fact that it is insanely fast. Now, here's the big kicker. The modulation in the tapping area at the very end is something we really, really need to talk about because it actually does have a very interesting and sort of cool way of using diatonic and non-diatonic function. So in this tapping sequence, we have entered C sharp minor with outlining these triads. C sharp minor, A, D sharp diminished, and then E major, C major, D major, E major. And then using the notes E, D, and C as pedal tones while chromatically descending, and then finally getting into a perfect cadence of B to E minor. So modulating there once again. The cool part is the D diminished chord. It actually works diatonically, considering that E is the relative major of C sharp minor, and that diminished chord can work as a leading tone to E major. So we've already kind of started pointing out that Eddie can use triads in so many weird and funky kind of ways, right? But the thing is, a lot of people will say, oh, Eddie didn't know any music theory. And I'm like, I think that's a little bit of a stretch to say that he'd know the number zero on music theory, considering the fact that all the most of the scales that he used, especially in this song, were pretty standard for the time and obviously using things like a diminished triad and then resolving it properly in sort of a tapping sequence it doesn't really sound like something that's just coincidence to me it sounds like something where he did know the tension is there and then it need to resolve and kind of move forward 
So anyways, Eddie isn't always known to break all the rules. Like something like Ain't Talking About Love uses a simple 1-6-7 chord progression in the key of A minor. Or in Jump from 1984, the chord progression is also very simple. It uses a simple 5-1-4 in the key of C major. And in Why Can't This Be Love from 1986 album 5150, he uses a simple 1-6-4-5 in the key of C major. And Eddie is also a huge fan of blues chord chord progression so if you know something like a 12 bar blues you can hear it very clearly in the song Ice Cream Man from their debut album. Now the final set of really crazy and weird chords to kind of take a look at is Cathedral, an instrumental track only bleeding about a one minute in time and Eddie uses some really weird chord extensions like the C major 7 over G, the F over C, and then the B sus 4. If I say C over G, okay, if I write out C over G, that's how you should first think of it is when you see C slash G C over G. Now you need to think about this in terms of a staff. So like this, super, super simple C over as an on top of G C major chord is on top of a G. This would technically be a C over G chord, right? Right there. Our G is on the bottom. You can also label that as a regular C major triad in second inversion. So 6-4 is totally fine too, but this is more of a modern way of notating these kinds of chords. So chord extensions are extremely, extremely simple. Okay, what I want you to think about is this. A regular triad, like a C major triad, is considered root third fifth, right? So super simple. Easiest thing we could do is add a seven on top. That's technically a chord extension. So this would make it what? a C major seven chord, right? Kind of like that. Okay. But here's the thing. We can add so many different kinds of chord extensions as long as we know how to count properly in music. So all you really got to know is the C major scale, since that's the uh, chord that we're doing right here, we have seven different notes in a scale. Okay. I can add any of these seven notes to this chord. Okay. I just have to give it the proper number. So let's say I added something like a two or what we can call it better a nine okay that would basically mean that this note right here d would be my two so if you if i wrote like c major seven add nine nine is just two up an octave okay that's the big thing if you see the number 11 it's four up an octave if you see 13 it's what six up an octave everything is just math in music okay so if you know how to count you should be able to figure this stuff out okay so what i would do here is i would find something like this right here there you go that's the chord right there you can do things like add sharp 11 where you sharpen the f and make it f sharp okay typically in standard jazz notation Whenever you add one sort of chord extension, you're going to end up adding the rest of them. So if you do like a 13, it's typically set that you're also, especially on the piano, going to have the ninth and you're also going to have the 11th and the seventh underneath it. But it all depends on the song. Finding key center for this is tricky, but one way to always find it is with cadences. So basically a cadence in music is the end of a phrase or maybe even the end of the entire piece think of it as the end of a chapter in a book or to signify the end of a melody or the end of the whole entire piece like i said so there are four basic types of cadences there are some little extra tidbits of some of these cadences but these are the standard four cadences so we have the authentic cadence the deceptive cadence the hap cadence and the plagal cadence okay each of them basically signifies the last two chords typically in the progression of the phrase the melody or the end of the entire piece authentic cadence is going to have the leading tone that is going to resolve to the tonic usually the dominant chord into the tonic the deceptive cadence when we hear a five chord it creates tension we want to hear it resolve but to deceive our audience we're not going to resolve it but instead we're going to go from a five chord to a six chord the half cadence is basically how we don't resolve it at all so we're actually going to do a one chord to a five chord 
and then we're just going to chill out right there and basically make people feel all uneasy at the end of a given piece. The plagal cadence. This one is basically a one chord to a four chord. It has a really nice, um, easy going, uh, ending, um, and totally works out fine. Um, not used as frequently, but I'll make a video on more in depth about cadences soon, but that's basically what a cadence is. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a deep dive into that chord progression that we just looked at and show you how we can figure out the key by looking at the cadences. So if you listen to the descending run about a minute in, it's clearly a G major scale feeling like it wants to resolve. But Eddie, of course, keeps using half cadences after this, stopping at the leading tone, and then of course, stopping at the note E, so really weird to say the least. So we've talked a lot about the chord progressions and stuff, but what about the riffs and, and what about the melodies and stuff like that? Hot for Teacher is another great example of using more bits of blues as chromaticism in the verse. Although the tapping in the intro mostly is a simple symmetrical position change using A minor to D major, then D minor to G major, then G minor to C major. So you can see there's a cool pattern going on of some modal mixture, regularly switching from the minor triad into the major four chord and so on. And of course, the next thing that we need to cover are some of his guitar solo work because that is some of his coolest work. So having crazy fast shreddy solos like Eruption, Ice Cream Man, or Hot for Teacher also comes some less crazy and more melodic solos like Ain't Talking About Love, Panama, or I'll Wait thing is that people don't really understand is that he knew when to dial it back when the song was more appropriate to have a more melodic solo or perhaps not even a guitar solo at all. But anyways, Eddie's solos were mostly a mix of tapping triads, shreddy blues runs, dive bombs, and outrageous stretching positions. Take the solo in Ice Cream Man for example. We basically use a stretch out E major arpeggio only using the high E string and then a G major arpeggio on the G string. Real quick guys, this is a video of my student Grayson shredding through the Hot For Teacher solo. He did an absolutely fantastic job for me, so I'm going to put in some little notes of some of the music theory stuff going on in this solo. However, the best overall guitar work in my opinion comes from Spanish Fly. So after starting with some light tapping harmonics and then a quick pentatonic blues tapping run, we have a really weird ascending run using whole steps similar to a major scale or even a whole tone scale and then into a 6 to a 5 cadence in A minor. We then go through some tapping arpeggios, basically outlining G minor over C, C major over D, and then a quick C major to F major, and then a new section using B flat, D minor, A major, so a six one five and then the same progression in c minor and then back into using a minor using e as the tension builder which would be a very good cadence there so as we kind of approach the end here we now have a very solid understanding of eddie van halen's music theory concepts throughout a good chunk of his career we've understood a lot of different things he uses with chord progressions his melodies his harmonies and all that really good stuff and that is pretty much it for evh guys so i really enjoyed doing this one and then i hope you learned as much as i did and i will see you guys in the next video